Have you ever wanted to wear armor while traipsing around in your everyday life? Do you think that the nightly aesthetic slaps, even though you disagree with strange women from the lake giving out swords as a form of government? Well, my friends, this is the video for you! That's right, folks! We're going to make medieval armor and transform them into everyday use. And the medieval armor part of choice is... The gambeson! Okay, now, first of all, what is a gambeson? A gambeson is a quilted top. It could have its length varying from the waist all the way to the knees. It could be fitted to the body or not. It could be with or without sleeves. It could be stuffed with a variety of things, including wool, cotton, rags, or even just made out of layers and layers and layers of linen. It could be worn under the chainmail, over the chainmail, under the plate armor, over the plate armor, or even just as armor on its own. So with all of that variation, what exactly is a gambeson? Well, fabric armor as a rule has been around for such a long time that the term gambeson and Wemby, Hackathon, Arming Duple, Jupong, Purpong, and even even more terms than that has been referring to the same and simultaneously different things all at once. At around the 11th century, mainly in Europe, gambeson and quilted armor is still one of the major forms of defense during battle. And then as chainmail and plate armor became more prevalent sometime around the 14th century, gambeson and other textile armor became more of a padding inside the harsh metal armor and to give one last line of defense. The whole sleeve, no sleeve, length and wearing depends on the particular decade and style. And the padding mainly depends on what the fighters could afford. Obviously, this is not the full history of the gambeson. There are so many other nuances that I could not hope to fit into a one-minute intro. But I hope that this gives you some kind of idea of what a gambeson is. And now let's get on to making them. I started with a bodice pattern and I traced them into the new piece of paper with this, as you can see, wonderful selection of items for pattern weight. I also added a little bit of length because I wanted to make the gambeson go all the way to the hips. I decided to make them a bit more fitted because I genuinely want to wear this as part of my daily wardrobe. So I kept the waist flare and the dark because, you know. There's also the choice of padding or padding and quilting patterns. I decided to quilt them vertically about 1 inch or 2.5 centimeters apart. Because in Ashdown's armor and weapon of the Middle Ages, a gambeson is quilted as a rule in vertical lines. That's where a gambeson in the 14th century. There are, of course, other gambeson quilting patterns, and so I wouldn't say that this is the historically accurate one, but quilting it in vertical lines also makes it easier for me to calculate how much width I have to add to the pattern. Quilting does shrink fabric a little bit because of the whole being pulled tautly together, and that, combined with the fact that this will have at least three layers on, makes me have to add some extra width to the pattern. If you quilt it in a wonderful, fantastical way, you can make the gambeson itself be fitted to you just by the quilting. But I don't have the time or honestly money to make the dozens of mock-up that would be required to properly fit that. So vertical lines it is. There's also the choice of padding. As I've said before, you can have wool, cotton, rags, or even just layers and layers and layers of linen to be your padding. For gambesons that are intended to be the sole armor, layers of linen are best. I'll talk about them a little bit later. But frankly, I do not have the money to buy that much linen, so I will not be doing that. <laughs> the other options are either quilting them with wool batting, cotton batting, or, and this is probably the more economically feasible one, to stitch the quilting lines of the outer fabric and the lining together, and then stuff them with either rags, tar, or vegetable fiber, or basically anything you can find. Once again, I do not have those things, but... I do have the leftovers of an airplane blanket that I use in my other quilting video, so I will just use that for my batting. Using what you have available for you is historical, so it fits. I've made this little patch of quilting using the same batting and the same linen, and found that each line of quilting shrinks the width of the fabric about 1mm. So I marked the quilting lines, which are as I've said vertical lines about 2.5cm apart from each other, and decided to do the cut and slash method of adding width to a pattern. At this point, I ran out of paper, so I rushed to get my whole stack of problem set papers and got to work using my most favorite way of recycling this fully written on papers, using them as pattern paper! I didn't actually cut every single piece of the quilting lines, I figured that would get old really quickly, but I cut about 3 or 4 of the lines and added probably about half a centimeter each to get this monstrosity of paper and tape. 
And then after that, it's just a regular pin the paper to the batting, cut the batting. I've decided to cut the batting net, which means no seam allowances, for reasons that I will explain later on. And spend probably half an hour just dying on the chair, because I have genuinely forgotten how tiring the cutting process is. Cut to the next day, and we're doing the same thing with the wonderful dark blue linen that I got, but this time I've put in seam allowances. We're cutting two of each piece, one for the outer fabric and one for the lining. And since we're going to be handling this quite a lot, and I would need to see where everything is in both the right side and the wrong side during the quilting process, I've decided to try to mark all of my seam lines, which is a good decision, I reckon. Then I just made my sandwich of linen, batting, and linen, and you see that the thread marking is coming in handy now, what with matching up the edges of the batting and the seam lines between the two pieces, and just pin them together. Repeat that with the other pieces, and we can move on to properly basting the pieces. I just used the quilting basting stitch, creating little zets all over the pieces, which holds the pieces quite nicely together for hand quilting. Hello, it is currently midnight, but I have finally finished basting all of them together, and we'll probably start quilting now? We'll see, either now or tomorrow. I decided to mark the quilting lines that night, but save the quilting for the next day. I marked the quilting lines 2.6cm apart this time, to take into account the 1mm shrinkage, and then we just spent hours and hours and hours quilting. This is the part where I'm quite happy that I have a class that's held primarily online because there is no way that I'm doing this while being in class, like in actual class. And if my prof is listening, no, this is not during class time. What makes you think that this is during class time? Now, some of you might be thinking, well, that's well and dandy, but how effective is several pieces of fabric sewn together as armor? Well, the answer to that is quite effective. As I've said before, the most effective gambeson as a standalone armor is the layers and layers and layers of linen up to around 30 layers sewn together. There is this wonderful article that I'll link here and in the description below that shows precisely how they tested this. And it's set to the test quite well against arrows, spears, hand axes, and swords. I would imagine it's almost the same principle as trying to slash or trust through a phone book. And yes, I do know what a phone book is. The many layers of it make it quite difficult to go through. The gambesons made with wool or cotton batting, or even just the rags stuffed into the quilting lines, are probably less effective on its own. But it still provides some protection against arrows and bladed weapons. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper than trying to commission plate armor and chainmail. So people do still use them. Also, for those wealthy enough to commission plate armor, gambesons are worn underneath them to be a counterpoint against the hardness of the armor. After the hand quilting is over, and I see now why this is an expensive thing to make, it took me hours to do that, we're basically just making a fest at this point. I pinned all the seams together and decided to do a late night sewing session. I just sewed all the seams using a backstitch, because at this point I remembered that this was supposed to be armor and it had to be durable. Now that I'm really, really happy that I didn't put seam allowances to the batting, just going through four layers of linen was already hard enough for my poor hands. Going through four layers of linen plus the two layers of batting would have been horrible. A lot of the modern gamison makers just quilted the whole piece of cloth, cut the pieces together, and sewed them. But they have the advantage of a sewing machine, which I, for one, do not have. I don't know what the proper historical method is, but I imagine that they also did not have an electric sewing machine back in the 14th century. But then I got too tired and decided to go to sleep, only to be woken up with this. With the snow brewing outside, I checked the fit of the gamison and then sewed the rest of the seams together, this time in daylight. And then, the trusty seam picker came to the rescue. No, I'm not unpicking my seam, I'm just unpicking all the thread marking that I no longer need. Then I pressed the seams open, and press the button flap in place. Proper gambesons lace together, either at the front or at the side, but I decided that lacing would probably take too much time when I use them, so buttons it is. I just folded the extra fabric together and fell them in place to make the button flap. For the buttons, I know that I don't want to ruin my fakely historical look by putting on a very clearly plastic button, but those are all the buttons that I have, so I decided that I would cover these buttons with the linen scraps that I have. And then, I want to make them a little bit puffy, but I don't have one of those fluffy feelings, so I went through a very much historical and traditional way of getting filling. 
the dryer. Lint from the dryer makes surprisingly good filling, so I just built the button with lint, make a trash shank from leftover embroidery thread, and voila! Five fakely historical looking buttons. Then I just made the buttonholes, which is a fantastic way to spend time in my opinion, and suit the buttons on. And then from there is just finishing all the seams by felling and finishing all of the row I just. By this point, I had just gotten out of my final exams, so I was too tired to figure out a way to finish this that doesn't involve just blatantly putting bias tape on every raw edge, and proceeded to do just that. It doesn't look too bad, does it? And there you have it! I'm actually quite proud of this. It fits me well, even though, and I don't know if you can see this from that footage before, one half is a bit longer in the front. I was drifting around in the snow with only that and a shirt on, and it was surprisingly warm, which, to be quite honest, is one of the main reasons that I'm making this. This took me about a month and a half to make, in between doing midterms and exams, and honestly, the main bulk of that is just on the hand holding. But this will definitely get a lot of use as the winter goes on. And that's it, folks! Thank you so much for watching, and do hit the thumbs up if you like this video. If you want more hand quilting shenanigans, check out this video here. And if you want more historical things, this playlist may be of interest to you. For the time being, enjoy this footage of me trying and failing to find a stick to play sport with, and I'll see you all next time! Bye!